Right now, Randy Glenn joins me live in Studio Q. Hello. Hi. Nice to be here. What a pleasure to have you here. It's a joy. Such an interesting project. First of all, congratulations on the success of this, this Dancing in the Third Act. I mentioned that members of your company have no dance background at all. Is that right? Mostly. A few of them have had a little bit, but not professional training. And yet, by all accounts, they come off like life, lifelong professionals winning rave reviews. How did you pull that off? Strictly theater magic. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors, yeah. Luck. And, well, I've been in the business a long time. I think a lot of creating good choreography is just paying attention to good craft, paying attention to what's in the room. You know, I had 12 seniors that had varying degrees of abilities, and I made use of what they had. The dance is theirs about them. Mm. Where did uh, what was the? I mean, I understand this project started modestly, just a group of uh, of your friends performing at a community event in in Nova Scotia. Is that right? Where it started was I was asked to do a flash mob in 2012 for the local farmers market, and um, you know, on being, the east coast, on the east coast, in Annapolis Royal. Mm. And being an out of work choreographer, you just say yes to everything. You know, kids, elephants. Sure, I, I can do that. So they all right, I can do a flash mob, never done one before. Most of the volunteers that showed up were seniors, and we rehearsed in a parking lot every Wednesday night, and it wasn't a great piece of choreography, but somewhere along the line, I looked at these people and I said, they have so much to offer. If I can get them in my craft zone, which is in a big theater, I can do something with them. And it started from there. I just took it, and we went with it. When did you realize that this was not just getting them into your craft zone, but this is something that could actually turn into a professional show that you would stage? I think during the working process, we started June of 2013. I think somewhere, I don't know, near the end of June, I realized it was going really well and we were somehow hitting a good vein and I was able to create work that worked for these people, simple the theatrical structures that operated, that carried resonance and power. And um, it came together really quickly. It's a one-hour dance, and I think we made it in less than four weeks. And then, well, seniors don't remember very well, so we spent the rest of the summer <laughs> rehearsing it. But it, it was early on in the process, I guess three or four weeks in, that it seemed to me that it had juice, to speak, so to speak. I want to ask you about the generational, generational nature of this, because... Um, and, you know, there's nothing, I mean, it shouldn't come as a shock that people in their 60s and 70s can be great dancers. Uh, and yet, when it comes to dance in particular, the kind of dance that that uh, is that gets uh, lauded and the, the kind of dance that we pay to see on stage, it is always seemingly associated with youth. It's true. Um, are there strengths older performer, performers bring to dance that younger ones might lack? Everybody moving brings their whole life lived to movement. You do, I do, everybody does. And if you can capture that life lived in the movement, in the structure of the dance, you can deliver substance that young people can't. I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm not a fan of youth-oriented dance, but it delivers often youthful energy. And old people, well, I mean, in, in this cast, we have 12 performers. We have over 800 years of experience. And wow. There's no 12-person dance company anywhere that can lay claim to that. So what I tried to do was not to stand in the way of it by bogging them down with what I know to be traditional dance movements. A lot of times they weren't within the realm of possibility. But by orchestrating them into scenarios that showed what they had to offer, we could capitalize and on And how do that. you do that? How, how do you harness that life lived in a physical form to communicate it and dance? Well, you have to get them moving in ways that um, they can already move in um, and then structure those, choreograph them so that um, they can operate together as a group well. That way. So there's some brief sections that are solos or duets, but mostly it's, a, it's an ensemble piece from beginning to end. We also tried to avoid counting because well, one thing I realized, if you're brought up as a dancer, you learn to you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. You can count and move at the same time. And these people had a lot of trouble with that. So we tried to make as few sections with rigorous counting as we could. Why is counting challenge? Well, I think counting, not so that the counting is such a challenge, although some people have trouble hearing the beat in any music, but it's counting and moving at the same time that mm. is a challenge. And um, remembering steps that are perhaps within your zone, but putting it all together in your... 75-year-old head can sometimes be hard. It can be hard for younger people, too. Is it easier working creatively with older people in some ways? I'm thinking they know themselves better. There, there may be a, um, a lack of ego or, or pretension in some way. 
Well, I, I would say that they were very responsible. They were very responsive. They were very conscientious. Um, they're tremendous to work with. Um, easier. There were no demands from them to do things. They were just thrilled to participate. Mm -hmm. When you work with professional dancers, you know, some have agendas, some don't, but it, it's often not as easy um, to work with professional dancers. I, I found them delight to work with. And once I gave up my notions of, well, we should do this, and we, you, know, you can't do that, no, how are we going to go forward if you can't? Just, no, sit down, relax, pay attention to the people in the room. And the spirit in the room was tremendous. I mean, a, a group of you know, adult people wanting to do something, enjoying the process. It was delightful. I mean, there are obvious advantages that off the top of my head that I can think of that younger people um, would in, will enjoy uh, dancing. You know, people in their teens, 20s, 30s, even 40s, energy, yeah. ag agility. Yeah. But having said that, why do you think there's such a cult of youth in the dance world? Well, because I think that's where it's focused its time. I mean, in reality, you can't earn a living as a dancer into your 60s, by and large, you know, unless you're a teacher or something. So the performing career for, well, for ballet dancers ends very young, tragically young. Modern dancers can go on longer. But I think that the discipline engenders youth by the fact that it not exactly kills off, but eliminates its older people um, as it goes. So I don't think it questions the business of should older people dance or not. It's just by its very nature, they put them out to pasture early on. You can't get work. So if you can't get work, you can't work in the field. There aren't many examples of older dancers. That's changing, I think, a little bit, though, because I mean, we got invited to go to Sadler's Wells this year to the Elixir Festival. Mm -hmm. Never heard of that before, but that's a festival of older dancers in London, England. And we couldn't go because we're going to Montreal instead. Oh, and there's folks doing amazing. Uh, Peggy Baker comes to mind, doing incredible things that uh, defying the notion that uh, you're supposed to pack it in uh, at 50 or something. I agree. Peggy and Margie Gillis too, right. both yeah. really great, great Canadian dancers who have carried on well beyond what would have been expected of them. You know, I understand you didn't start dancing until you were well into your 20s. <laughs> looking looking back, was there an advantage to starting later? Was there any advantage? I mean, you'd, you'd think that you'd, you'd have the odds stacked against you by starting at that age. Somewhat. Uh, well, you have to say the, the truth is that men in dance have a little easier go of it than women do. But arriving late in dance, I didn't have preconceived notions of what dance should be. I didn't have any residual bad training of any sort. I was an athlete. And um, I just came to dance clean, like, tell me what to do and I'll do it as best I can. And it hooked me and I, I really went into it without preconceived notions, trying to figure out how to become the best dancer I could. I worked hard at, at doing it. So it's not um, something that you have to have been doing since you were five years old in order to excel? Generally speaking, if you want to be a ballet dancer, like if you wanted to be a classical violinist, you have to start it younger. But my discipline was modern dance, and I think it's more accommodating of personalities and different body types. I would have had a lot of trouble being a ballet dancer starting at 25. I, I don't know that there's many that have succeeded there or gone very far. Lots are retiring by the time they're 25. Wow. But I was, you know, genetically I'm, I'm not um, worn out by the time I'm 25, and I jumped in feet first and had, had a fabulous career for 10 years touring around. Nobody ever told me that you couldn't go forever. I never really thought, you know child of the 60s. It just goes on forever, you know. Good on you. I'm speaking with award-winning dancer and choreographer Randy Glynn about his life and career, including this hugely successful Dancing in the Third Act, which features dancers in their 60s and 70s. What, what has, Randy, what has this experience taught you about how we treat older people in our culture? Well, I think the, hard to answer that simply, the more I can relate to the effect of the dance on people, so I guess that has a bearing on your question. The dance seems to empower people, and not just old people, although it does empower old people. So when we perform it and field comments afterwards, there are things like, they're just people are so inspired that a group of old people can go on stage and touch them so deeply. And that's been exciting for us to do. So I'm not sure how people, I mean, how do people treat Do we underestimate dancing? what seniors or, or older folks are capable massively. of? I think massively, yeah, we underestimate what they're able to do. I mean, I made dancing in the third act in 2013. This past summer, I made one that, a dance, another dance that combined seniors and teenagers together. Um, 
it was called uh, Teen Angel. It perhaps should have been called Herding Cats because teenagers are harder to get in the room. <laughs> but the effect was similar and, and empowering again where we had teenagers and senior citizens dancing together on stage. It was, um, again, it just left the audience touched and empowered. And what about the performers? What do, what do the, the, the older folks who are doing the, actually doing the dancing in the third act uh, say to you about how the experience has affected them? I think they found it, most of them, somewhat life-altering because um, they thought that when they went into it, it was just going to be, I think in their own words, a lark. We'll do it because Randy asked us to do it and we got together. And very quickly, I think they realized that it was going to go much further. You know, by the time we started assembling the piece, some of them, until the performance happened, they had no idea what was made. And one of the men kept saying, every time somebody would say, well, that's really good, he'd say, Really? He never really realized it until the, hmm. the curtain closed and the audience jumped to its feet and wouldn't stop clamping. And he's, he realized then, and so did they all, that we'd made something very powerful. Your, your generation. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the baby boom generation, if you, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> any chance to dump on the baby boomers. Please do it. Please but do it. The, We're the, baby, ready. the baby boom generation is continuing to be active well into what might be previously described as old age. That's the big change. Truly. You know? uh, do you see this show as uh, part of a trend towards increased participation of more senior people in all parts of culture? I think as the boomers head into the years that they're now heading into, they will look to be active in whatever way they can. I think all generations will. We're just such a large cohort coming forward and for the first time going into comparatively healthy senior years. Yes. And there's no way that these seniors are idle or old. They're unbelievably active. Um, the small community in Annapolis Royal where um, I made the dance the seniors were so active that it was hard for them to find three hours, three times a week to come mm. to rehearsal because they're involved in this committee and that. I kept saying, don't be involved in so many committees. Come to <laughs> rehearsal. But there's lots to do and there are lots of capabilities there. Yeah. And enthusiasm and physical, physical, I don't know, prowess too. And how has this project uh, affected you? How has it changed you? I think when I started it, to be honest, I didn't think of myself as a senior even though I'm 64, 63 when I started it. And I thought, I, maybe because I was the teacher that I'm different than all of the others, mm. but it's not true. I'm a senior just like they're seniors. And uh, if anything, that, I think that's what it's made me realize, that I too am a senior and proud of it. A lot of 64-year-olds year old, listening right now going, I am not a senior. <laughs> but that's part of the, the, the almost taboo that is uh, quite a shame. I'm, I've said it a few times on the show that it, it, I, I'm quite um, disappointed with the way um, we see aging in this society and, and, and the way we see older people where, where um, in, in other societies or in other, other times, the elders were venerated. The, el the elders were seen as the greats. These, these are people that you go to for advice. And, and we, in recent decades, have become so youth-obsessed that um, elders or, or seniors or older folks can be cast aside often, uh, which is, makes no sense to me. Makes no sense to me either. I mean, certainly I don't wish to be cast aside, right. <laughs> just like any older person. I mean, you also have to earn your respect. You have to, you can't just sit there and say, well, I'm old and therefore I know. You have to continue doing. And I think these people that are doing dancing in the third act and myself, and we're continuing to do stuff. And if you do stuff to the fullest, I think the respect will come. Maybe it's harder to earn in our gigantic youth obsessed society but it's earnable i think we did mm. although to a certain extent when you are older you do just know you do <laughs> please you just have more what, stories a, in your, your, your you you know i have lots of stories the, always... the other side of knowing however is forgetting which is one thing that we <laughs> right. deal with actually in the right. piece and it, there, there is truth in the fact that we we would rehearse sections early on in this process and then I might not return to a section of the dance for five or six days, and I'd say, well, we're going to run that section again, and several of the people in the room would say, what section was that? <laughs> so there is this, I may know stuff, but I forget stuff. Too. What a great project. Thanks so much for coming in. A pleasure. Great to see you. Randy Glenn, award-winning dancer, choreographer. His show Dancing in the Third Act features performers in their 60s and 70s with no formal dance training. It opens the Cartier uh, Dance Festival in Montreal next Friday. Randy Glenn has been with me here live in Studio Q.